Anglo-Saxon Boy, Chapter 9 Test of Strength Magnus spent that night with the off-duty house carls in the thorny barracks. He brooded on what his father had said and found it hard to sleep. Had he passed his father's test, he had hoped the Earl would agree with him and give him an immediate order for 500 of the house carls to ride north and save Tostig. Magnus dozed off eventually, although his dreams were full of blades and blood and corpses. Wake up, Magnus, said Hakon, shaking him. Your father wants to see you. Magnus opened his eyes only to be dazzled by light flooding into the barracks from the high windows along its walls. Then Hakon's words sank in and Magnus sprang from his bed. He pulled on his boots and hurried out, trying to buckle on his sword belt as he ran. Suddenly he stopped and turned to Hakon, who was waiting in the barracks doorway, looking amused. Where will I find my father, Hakon? Not in that direction, said Hakon. You'd better follow me. Hakon took Magnus back to the King's Hall. They walked down dark, narrow passages, coming at last to a large room. A dozen scribes, most of them monks, sat at tables working on piles of documents. Earl Harold sat at another table writing a letter. After a moment, the Earl signed the letter, stamped the wax seal with his signet ring, and handed it to a house carl who hurried away. Well, Magnus, you'll be pleased to know that I'm riding north today, said the Earl. You were right. Something needs to be done as soon as possible. Thank you, Father, said Magnus. I'm sure my Uncle Tostig will be relieved when he sees you riding into York at the head of 500 men. That won't be happening just yet, Magnus. I need to talk to some other people before I decide what to do. There are many things to take into account. But you will help Uncle Tostig, won't you? said Magnus, puzzled. Don't worry, it will all be dealt with. His father paused for an instant, his face serious but then he smiled. Hakon tells me you handled yourself well in the fight you had in the north, he went on. He says you might even have the makings of a leader. So I'm putting you in charge of a full troop of house cars while you're here on Thorny. Do you think you could lead 50 men in battle, Magnus? I, I would do my best, father, said Magnus. He should have known his father would ask Hakon about him. The house Carl had served under many troop leaders in his time, so he knew what he was talking about. Magnus felt glad he had come up to scratch. This must mean that he had passed his father's test. I could ask no more of any man, said Earl Harold. Hakon will explain your duties to you. Now leave me. I have much to do before I set out. The Earl rode north at dawn the next day, before Magnus had chance to bid him farewell. It was high summer and Magnus wouldn't see him again till the autumn. Over the next few weeks, Magnus discovered that being a troop leader was rather more complicated than he had imagined. There were duty rosters to work out, training to supervise, problems to solve. The house cars were fine warriors, but sometimes they drank too much in the island's taverns and got into fights with each other, or with the sworn men of other lords. Magnus had to sit in judgments on the wrongdoers, some of them seasoned warriors more than twice his age. He always took Hakon's advice on what punishment to give. Usually it was stopping their pay for a while, although that didn't really bother them. As Hakon said, nobody became a house call for the money, even if Earl Harold was a generous man. They did it to serve their lord, to fight for him and win glory and fame and the oath a sworn man took bound him to one thing above all, to die for his lord. When a lord fell on the field of battle, his house carls died with him, or lived in shame. A better punishment was extra guard duty in the king's hall, with its pale of sickness and gloom. They all hated it, Magnus included. The hall never seemed to empty, the clusters of nobles and priests whispering and plotting and glaring at each other, day and night. A crowd of ghouls waiting for Edward to die. Whatever you thought of the king, 
and the more Magnus saw of Edward, the less he liked him. He was still a man, and it seemed terrible to be so hated at the end of his life. But they all enjoyed guard duty on the bridge, deciding who was allowed onto the island. There was a constant stream of traffic, nobles and priests to see their king, servants and slaves to work for him, carts arriving full of supplies and leaving empty. Magnus and his men checked everything, and he reveled in the sense of power it gave him. Everyone who came to the gate had to do as he said, whoever they were. Watch out, lads, said Hakon one dull afternoon. These two look like trouble. Magnus saw his brothers, Godwin and Edmund, approaching the gate, their cloaks travel-stained, their horses plodding wearily. Magnus glanced at Hakon, who smiled. Then Magnus nodded to the men to open the gate. He stepped out and held up a hand. Halt in the name of King Edward, he said. Who comes to Forney? His brothers reined in their horses. Is that you, Magnus? said Godwin, peering down at him. Be a good little brother and get out of our way, will you? We've been on the road for five days and we're tired, so hurry up, said Edmund. Magnus stared at him and didn't step back. I say again, who comes to Thorny? You must give me your names and state your business here. Godwin laughed. Come on, Magnus, what are you playing at? Playing, said Magnus, his eyes locked on Godwin's now. This is no game for children. I am the leader of the king's gate guard. And I can let no man through who will not tell me his name and say what business he has on Thorny Island. This is ridiculous, said Edmund. Tell him to stop being stupid, Hakon. I cannot do that said Hakon, shrugging. He is lord and master here. There was a silence for a moment, and Magnus knew the house calls behind him were enjoying this test of his strength. Godwin and Edmund looked at each other and finally gave in. We are Godwin and Edmund Haraldson, here to pay our respects to the king and also to meet our uncles, Gerth and Leofwine snapped Godwin. Is that good enough for you? I suppose it'll do, said Magnus. He knew he could make some remark now to belittle them further in front of Hakon and the house carls, but that would probably risk turning them into real enemies. They were his brothers, and he wanted them on his side, so he grinned instead. Had you worried there for a while, didn't I? he said. Welcome to Thorny. It's good to see you, my brothers. There was laughter from Hakon and the house calls, the kind that eases tensions, and the anger drained from his brother's faces. You think you're funny, do you? said Godwin, smiling. Maybe we should wipe that grin off your face. You're welcome to try, Magnus said, shrugging and grinning even more. Magnus took them to the barracks and helped them settle in. He was still a little wary of them, to begin with wondering if their old friendship was truly restored, but he soon knew that it was. He asked how things were at home and briefly told them about his trip to the north. Then he asked why they were meeting their uncles. Father sent a messenger to say we were to join their house calls, said Edmund. Me with Gerfs, Godwin with Leofwines. They're coming here to collect us. Did the messenger say what father was doing? asked Magnus. No, said Godwin, just that he was in Mercia. Mercia? said Magnus, surprised. I thought he was going to York. There was no mention of that, said Edmund. Magnus said no more, but his mind was whirring. <laughs>